Perfect. Thank you very much, Linda, for the for the nice introduction. So, um, as as Linda says, I'm a molecular geneticist. So I'm a scientist. I'm an automedical doctor, and um, yeah. So I my talk was about trying to explain why we don't uh, know the gene uh, or cause of um, your child syndrome. Um, but I, I think I have also slides to give you a little background that um, was overlapping with the report, so hopefully you can understand it, and otherwise you, we can discuss at the end. So, um, just to give you numbers about the human genomes, um, each, um, each individual has a, a complete, two complete sets of chromosomes, uh, 23 chromosome pairs, uh, as you can see on those slides, uh, which are all karyotypes. And altogether, it's quite a, a lot of information. It represents 6 billion of base pairs. Uh, what we call base pairs are actually four different letters, A, uh, G, T, O, C, as you can uh, see here. So um, each cell um, has, has uh, these, these uh, 23 pairs of, of chromosomes, and males and females differ in the sex chromosomes, with males having one copy of chromosome X, and females having two copies of chromosome X. And if we um, unwind the, the DNA and put uh, it uh, from one cell and put it end to end, it would be about two meters of, of DNA, which is quite a lot. And this represents about 25,000 genes. So, as you all know, all uh, human beings are different. And this is at least very largely uh, genetically determined. So if you look at uh, uh, individuals who have the same genome, um, monozygotic twins, they very look uh, like uh, they, they look very much alike. Uh, so the color of our skins, how we look like, and also many of our characteristics are, are genetically determined. But of course not. Everything is genetically determined. So. Uh, uh, there are many, many different factors, especially environmental factors, that um, makes us uh, unique. Um, but if we go back to genetics, there are two main uh, um, types of information. Uh, one is called single nucleotide polymorphism, or SNPs, and it corresponds to a change of one of these four letters, and it's replaced by another of these letters. And it happens quite frequently in our genome one every uh, thousand base pairs. So it represents one, uh, zero one percent of, of our genome, which is variable uh, at this position. On the other hand, uh, there are um, bigger changes that are called copy number variants. So it's uh, parts of chromosome that are either uh, duplicated or, or, or lost. Uh, and also in normal individuals, they are uh, quite a lot of them, as you can see on, on this slide, each dot is a, is a copy number variant. Um, and actually, you, all the types of uh, changes that you can imagine can be found in humans if they are compatible with life. So because it's uh, very difficult uh, to understand this, uh, this concept, I, I wanted to give you an analogy. So let's say the, gen the genome is a collection of books, and if each chromosome would be a book. And a gene would represent a chapter of the book, or um, if it's a cookbook, it would represent a, a recipe, uh, like this, this recipe for pandemic cake, for example. And then if we compare um, uh, genes uh, to sentences, um, it's quite easy to explain uh, the, variants, the types of variants that we observe. Uh, for example, the missense variant would be a change in one of the letters. So just this uh, very simple sentence will make it turn into a large mixing bowl. If you replace, let's say, this B by a C, you would uh, have a different meaning of the sentence that, that would not be very, very meaningful, actually. Uh, if you replace one of the uh, letter by a, a full stop, uh, you would also not uh, understand the letter. And, and if you delete a letter or insert a letter, it would also um, create uh, some, some fresh sheet that you do not understand. And the um, larger changes that I was talking about, uh, duplication and deletion, could be um, duplication of um, more than or one word or more than one word. Uh, and it would also disrupt the sentence. Or, or if you just um, remove some words, it will not be understandable. 
On the other hand, if you just remove some words like large, it would probably not affect the meaning of the sentence, or if you just insert another uh, space uh, next to another space, it would not affect the meaning of the sentence. It's very, uh, very much alike to what we see in the human genome. So, um, genes are actually composed of different parts. Um, so it's, it's a very complicated study. The idea is just to understand that these are complex units uh, composed of different parts. Parts that we say coding uh, would actually uh, encode an information that um, is about to read protein, uh, and parts are non-coding. And uh, I could compare this, the, the coding parts of, of the genes, uh, to ingredients, for example, for a, a recipe. So, if we uh, compare the protein to the biscuit, for example, one coding uh, exon could be uh, the ingredients for the dog, and uh, the other part would be the ingredients from the, from the cream, the script of the cream. And if you uh, just disrupt the information to make one part of the, the cake, uh, then you will not be able to have cake. And coming back to the analogy of books, um, so most of the time most of what we do is uh, just to analyze the coding part of the uh, genome because it's the part that we can really interpret. Um, so we, even if we uh, sequence a genome, so if we uh, look at all the books, we would look at the coding regions which only represent 1 to 2 percent. Uh, so it would be like looking at all the ingredients of all the recipes in all those books. And uh, even sometimes we only look at some, um, some genes, so only some uh, ingredients of, of the recipes. Uh, so it would be for, we just look, uh, for example, uh, ingredients for salads, uh, and we would not see ingredients for, for cakes, for example. And uh, so I think uh, Paul wanted to, to um, say that uh, it's very easy now to uh, sequence the genome, so uh, uh, we've made many uh, progresses over the last decades to, to the technologies that have evolved a lot and we are able now to analyze uh, genomes for a price that is uh, quite low, still, still not accessible to, to everyone, but uh, uh, about a thousand dollars, which is, which is quite low compared to what we used to spend uh, some years ago. So we can have the full information almost about the millions of variants uh, that are in our genomes. So the problem is not to have access to this information, the problem is really to find the information that matters. So I would compare this uh, to trying to find the typo in this uh, very large files of books without knowing where it is. So to do so, we use what we call uh, filters, um, filters to remove variants and to look at the ones that, uh, that are meaningful. So for example, we uh, remove, so we have in one genome, we have about two million variants. Uh, so what we do is we first uh, look at um, variants of whether which have good quality, so variants uh, that are not after We uh, will uh, look at variants that are rare in population, and so this is very important to have an idea of uh, variants that are present in each population, not just a uh, um, population of Europeans or, or also populations that are uh, in India, in Japan, etc. And we will look at uh, these coding regions uh, that I, I was talking about. And if we do so, we will reduce the number of variants that we have to look at at about 200, 800 variants. And what would really help is to uh, filter on what we call inheritance pattern. It means that we, if we look only at the individual who has a disorder, it's, it's this number of variants. But if we look also at healthy relatives in, in the family or other affected uh, individuals in the family, it, it is much easier to find the variants. And in that case, we would see only zero to 10 variants. So how this is possible? It's possible because um, so we have familial cases, um, and in this case, we would simply look at variants that are shared by affected individuals. So we split the regions that were, or the books that we have to look at by just looking at the ones that are similar uh, between individuals. Um, so if it's just siblings, for example, we could look at information that is similar on both chromosomes and that it is uh, just present in, in one variant. And for patients who are um, without family history, so uh, 
young person uh, affected in the family, we would look at the noble bands or bands that are present only in the affected person and not uh, in uh, his or her parents. And uh, we would also look uh, like in this case at uh, bands that are present on both chromosomes uh, and uh, present on only one chromosome one there. What we call recessive bands. And um, we would look also in males uh, for uh, bands that are present in the single chromosome class. So, just to have a focus on, on these single mutations that are extremely important in um, neurodevelopmental disorders. So, it's the main cause of um, um, disorder in, in the population. So, what happens is that uh, there is a change that is not present in, in the parents, but this change occurs in one germ cell, so either the egg or the sperm of one of the parents. And this would lead to an individual who has the mutation, uh, but he's the first one in, in uh, this family to have this mutation. And on average, um, we have about 100 uh, de novo mutations by genome, uh, but one to two in the coding region. So it means that we all have the novel mutations, but only one or two to be continued. Uh, so because it's so difficult to interpret variants, um, the uh, American College of uh, Medical Genetics has um, advised uh, geneticists to use some uh, classification. And the goal is to reach this classification, which is quite simple. There are five levels of classification, pathogenic, likely pathogenic, um, likely benign or benign, or variants of unknown significance. And pathogenic or likely pathogenic means we are quite confident that, or completely confident that uh, it's the cause, or it, it leads to a disease. Benign, benign means that we think it, it's a, a common polymorphism, or, or even a rare polymorphism in the population. And variants of unknown significance means we absolutely don't know. So it could be pathogenic or benign, and we simply don't know the, the answer. So if we look at the cohort of patients with developmental disorders, um, so if we look at many patients, we would have approximately 50% of patients in which we would find only likely benign or benign variants, while uh, uh, in 30%, approximately, we would find uh, pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants. And in 15, at least 50%, we would find variants of no significance. So, the uh, current classification means that these uh, patients with variants of a known significant are still unsolved. So I uh, plan to go to a, a few examples with you to, to show you uh, how we can address uh, these questions and try to, to go uh, beyond. Um, so this is an example of a family. So it's a sporadic case. It's a, it's a male with a uh, ACC, so uh, a genesis of the corpus callosum, severe intellectual disability, and seizures, and it is the only one affected in Spanish. So we uh, perform the situation that uh, has been seen in Belgium. So we perform exon sequencing uh, in the patient and the parents, both parents, and what we could find is a variant in the gene called TAF1 on the X chromosome. It's a missent variant, meaning that it replaced a letter by another letter, so it's difficult to interpret. And we know that uh, this gene is associated with intellectual with two different disorders, but in that case, uh, the disorder that would uh, be meaningful with intellectual disability, uh, uh, X-linked syndrome in 33. And these are the symptoms that uh, are usually present in these patients, including intellectual disability and hypoplasia of the corpus. <coughs> so what we did is try to um, study um, other uh, family members, um, and what we could see is this variant is present on the X chromosome uh, at the imizygous state only in this patient, meaning that all uh, other individuals carrying, carrying the, the variant are all females. There are no other males in the family with this variant. So it's compatible with uh, the fact that this variant is pathogenic. And there is a, a paper. Uh, addressing uh, exactly this question, the challenge to, um, to interpret variants in this gene. And as you can see here, there is another patient that has been reported in this 
this article, which uh, has exactly the, or a, a variant that has the exact same position, and uh, in this article, they could they, they still consider this as a variant of unknown significance, although the signs that they report are very uh, similar to this patient. So until now, this, this patient is still considered uh, considered as unsolved, although he has this variant of unknown significance in class one. The second example is um, this uh, patient with a complete agenesis of the corpus callosum. He has had a developmental delay and learning difficulties. Uh, he is quite, uh, he is quite talking well, and um, he speaks, uh, and he just has mild learning difficulties. And we also did exome sequencing in the child and in the post parents. And we found a variant in a gene called SMART-T1, um, which was the novel. The only thing is the, the, the gene at the time was not associated with any disorder. It was a very good candidate because this gene encodes a protein or a cake that, that is very similar to AOE1B, so a gene that is uh, very well known to cause this type of phenotype. Um, so at this point, we had two different choices. Either to screen other families with similar phenotypes in the hope to find a mutation in that gene, or to exchange information. And this is what we did. And we could find other patients, uh, 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 collaboration with PPP Congo, who had mutation in the same gene. Uh, and we could uh, gather this, this collection of patients and um, suggest that these uh, mutations lead to a normal disorder. The third example is this family, so it's a family with um, females who have uh, a complete agenesis or a partial agenesis of the corpus callosum uh, associated with a normal condition, uh, only mild learning difficulties for some of them. And so we uh, did an exome sequencing and we looked for mutations or variants that were uh, shared by these uh, affected individuals. And they were only limited a limited number of variants that were shared by all the individuals. It was only this variant in GMCL1 that is not associated to any disorder, and this variant in the gene called BCC. Um, and we knew this gene because it was associated with a different condition, which was mirror movement. And we knew the gene so well that we had the uh, described mutation in this gene in patients with this condition mirror movements. And so we came back to the families. And we looked if some of the individuals in those families with mirror movement could have a genesis of corpus callosum. And this was actually the case in this family with a non sense mutation. So it's a mutation that if it introduced a full stop in the sentence, you can see these two individuals with uh, um, a genesis of the corpus callosum. And we um, got in touch with uh, Linda Richards and uh, Paul Lockhart, um, and we could, they had also identified the same um, or different mutation in the same gene, uh, and we could um, put a cohort and uh, uh, show that mutation in the DCC gene uh, caused a genesis of the corpus callosum with what we call um, variability in the phenotype, so it can code either a genesis of the corpus callosum or mirror movements, and also some individuals with mutation in this gene are also unaffected, so this is what we call incomplete penetrance. The fourth example is a patient with uh, a genesis of the corpus callosum, language delay, and also mild intellectual disability. Again, we perform exome sequencing in the uh, the, the child and the parents, and we could find a de novo mutation in the gene called KIF21B, uh, which was also not associated uh, with any disorder at the time. And we also um, got in touch with other groups using gene matcher, uh, but the problem was the phenotype of the patients was, was very different from one patient to the other. In particular, the, the other patients were, were much more severely affected and the, their uh, brain MRI was fully normal. But um, we uh, contacted Juliette Godin, who um, uh, had access to the mouse model that was developed by Dina Zialsin, who is also a member of IRC5, and she could study the mutation in vitro in the mouse and she could prove that actually all these mutations have different impacts uh, during brain development. 
and which explains that uh, they are also associated with different phenotypes. So sometimes gathering families is not enough. You also need to a uh, functional study to prove that the mutation is really responsible for the phenotype. The fifth example, and I think it could be the last one, um, uh, is um, an exome sequencing in a girl with a, a partial agenesis of the corpus callosum. Uh, she was uh, hypotonic at birth, and she has developmental delay, and then she uh, developed a West syndrome, so seizures that were uh, very uh, intractable resistant to anti-epileptic drugs. And we found a de novo variant in a gene called CREPBP, um, uh, in exon 2, two of these genes. Um, and the problem is this finding doesn't fit with what we know of the gene. Uh, although this gene is also associated with agenesis of the corpus callosum, the phenotypes that are associated with the genes are um, rubinstein tabi syndrome, which is a very recognizable syndrome. And this patient doesn't have this, uh, this syndrome. And the other um, um, uh, syndrome that is associated is called uh, Menke Ekenam and a CAM syndrome, and these are caused by missense variant in uh, exon 30 or 31, and it's also uh, very different from the, what the patient has. So, at um, today, um, this patient, we still don't know if this variant uh, is responsible for the phenotype or not, and we are still looking for patients that have a similar phenotype. So the case is completely insolved, and, and it's not clear if this new mutation is responsible for this phenotype. And I wanted also to give you some examples of syndromes for which we never find a cause, even if we look very hard. And one of these syndromes is Ecardi syndrome. So in Ecardi syndrome, um, there is um, a triad of features that um, are very characteristic of the syndrome including agenesis of the corpus callosum, chorioretinal lacunae, and infantile, infantile spasm. And there are also associated features that, are, uh, that, can, that can support the, um, the, the um, diagnosis of Ecardi syndrome. So including uh, other cortical malformation, other eye malformation, or um, social microphthalmia, for example, vertebral and costal abnormalities, for example. And in this, uh, syndrome, most of the case or almost all of the case are uh, females and only uh, some males have been described uh, and they all have 47 chromosomes including 2X, which uh, has led to hypothesize that the pathogenic variant is on chromosome X, but despite uh, many uh, different uh, um, analyses in, in different groups over the world, uh, the cause of these syndromes remains unknown. The second example is septo-optic dysplasia, which uh, was previously uh, known as the, the Morsier syndrome. And this syndrome is also associated with a triad of features, including absence of the septum pellucidum, which is the, the membrane separating the, the, uh, the ventricles of the, of the uh, hemispheres, um, uh, optic nerve hypoplasia, and it's also associated with impaired vision in this patient, and also pituitary gland dysfunction. And Although there are some um, um, variants that have been described, in, especially in uh, this gene, LCX1 and SOX2, most of the case, 91% of the uh, patients with this syndrome, uh, remains on SOX so far. And it's not clear uh, what, it, what the cause is. So why is this that some, in some uh, cases we can't find a mutation? So to come back at um, the different part of genes and, and what it, um, it, it, it is. Um, so if I, I come back to this analogy of cakes. So what I said is I look, we look at coding regions, which are ingredients of um, for a cake, for example. And we never or very rarely look at um, regulatory regions uh, because we, we don't know exactly how to interpret these variants. But these regions are very important. So they, we could uh, compare them to uh, instruction to bake the cake or to mix in, for example. For example. So if you don't have the, uh, these uh, instructions, you would be also, it would be also very difficult to get this cake in the end. And um, we know that 80% uh, of uh, the human genome has actually a recognized biological role as a 
to regulate gene expression. And this is uh, what enhancers and promoters do. They, they uh, regulate gene expression. And the rest is probably very important for genome structure. So the chromosome structure is a compact form of the DNA. And uh, this is enabled uh, because of uh, certain structure. And um, so it, it, it's folded. And uh, this is uh, allowed uh, thanks to information encoded in the genome. But if we want to look at the full information of the genome, then we have to go back. Uh, if we uh, just filter on, on the methylene frequency, then we would have to look at 20 to 30,000 variants, which is a, very, a lot of information. So we would uh, not look only at coding regions. And even if we uh, use um, uh, unaffected uh, family members, we would have to look at about 100 de novo variants more than 30 rare or private structural variants. And uh, there are also many variants that are not detected by the current method, although uh, we are getting um, uh, there. We, we are now having methods that can really sequence a full genome. And also, looking at non-coding parts of the, region, uh, of the genome, it's very difficult to have functional tests, uh, because if we uh, look at animal models, for example, this is exactly the regions that are not conserved between the mouse and the human. And so we would need to really design uh, experimental models that are just for, for humans. And so this would look like this. Um, so this is the future of, of genetics, but uh, this is quite uh, difficult at the moment. So it, it's really a challenge to, to look at all the non-coding parts of the genome. The uh, good news is uh, that um, a consortium called the Telomere to Telomere Consortium has started to fill in all the gaps that existed uh, in the human genome uh, that were previously called dark regions. And um, so there were these, these regions that could not be sequenced uh, before because it was so, it, it caused them to, to repeat in regions, so very complex regions. And now, uh, thanks to, to this consortium, we have a new reference genome, which is without gap, meaning that now we have the uh, regions also of the repeated regions forming the centromeres, the telomeres, all the difficult parts of the genomes. And so this can be used, this new information can be used to try to find the cause in unsolved patients. Another current challenge is somatic mosaicism. So I told you at the beginning uh, that a de novo mutation is a mutation that occurs either in the sperm or in the egg, uh, and then would be uh, in all the cells of an individual. But it happens that the mutation doesn't occur in a germ cell, but occurs during uh, development. And in this case, the individual is composed of cells with the mutation and with cells without the mutation. And then it becomes more difficult to uh, look because usually we look, in, uh, we look at the genome from um, genomic DNA extracted from blood. Uh, and it might happen that the blood is not the right tissue to see this mutation. And just to let you know that in some cases, uh, we know that the mutation is only uh, confined to the brain. So meaning that looking at the blood, we will never be able to see this mutation. So um, I've reached my conclusion. So in conclusion, there are many possible reasons explaining why we don't know the gene or cause of dual child syndrome. We have seen examples where the variant has been identified, but classified of unknown significance. A uh, variant had been identified, but the gene was not associated with any disorder. And this, uh, this is where we can really uh, make a difference if we gather families and if we, we can um, make groups all over the world collaborate and we, we have a chance to really see even the, the, the rarer disorders and put them together. Um, we have seen cases where, or, or I haven't uh, actually showed you, but there are cases where the variant has been missed by the current techniques um, when it's uh, located in very difficult to sequence regions, um, or the variant uh, can be also located in non-coding parts of genes. And it can also happen that the cause is non-genetic or is caused by many different variations that are maybe benign alone, but if they are combined, it could be uh, pathogenic, what we call polygenic. 
So the current challenges are to interpret the non-coding variants, as I as, uh, pointed out, to detect uh, a low um, mosaicism, so when, when the mutation occurred during development and is confined to a specific tissue, and to understand genetic interactions. And further steps include the analysis of additional family members, for example, if only the child has been uh, 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 analyzed, it is very important that the parents or maybe the FC siblings can be analyzed to identify families with variants in the same gene syndrome and uh, to do functional studies or develop uh, animal models. Um, and I'm very happy that I'm part of, you know, the human geneticist. So we try to find the genes and then we plan to give them to um, neurobiologists uh, like Linda. So I think there are some work for a few years after we found the gene. So I thank you for your attention. Um, I thank uh, all the, the people um, from the IRC5 and also from my former group in France uh, who brought me to this field and I'm very happy to answer your question. So I don't any I don't hear anyone talking. So maybe I can just look at the questions that are on the chat. Um, so I see one question: If West was done as a fit at a fitted time, is it recommended so you, to do? You can you can see them, correct? You can see the chat. I can see one question in the chat. Okay. Hello, okay. Elliot. Yeah. The sound is extremely low when you speak. Now, can you hear Christelle? Is that better? I can hear you, but it's it's very um, low. But I can hear. So I, I hope that people in the Zoom can also hear. OK. Um, are there questions from the audience? Um, Okay, so first of all, lovely talk, uh, lots of information, um, very, very exquisitely presented. Um, Christelle, I, I think you said there's something in the chat. Can you read that aloud and then um, go ahead and take a stab at it? So now I can't hear you. As someone muted ah. me. <laughs> So if was what if was so whole exome sequencing was done at fetal time, is it recommended to do West again somewhere later after the baby is born, let's say in a few years? So I it depends uh, how the the, the uh, whole exome sequencing what was done, but I think if it's still unsolved, I would say yes, for two reasons. The first is of course uh, at fetal stages, what we um, um, Analyze is not blood. Uh, it's it's a, a fluid that we take in the amniotic uh, um, cavity. So it's it's uh, cells that are from the fetus, but that are uh, not the blood. So if we analyze this a few years later, it would be a different tissue. So it might uh, lead to um, identify a mutation that would not be there. Uh, would be in, in the blood, for example. The second reason is that um, the technologies evolve very rapidly. So doing West in, um, in five years time might change um, or also might just change because the gene would be known five years later. Okay, great. Any other questions? Okay. I think we'll, um, we're gonna take a break at this point. Oh, wait. Oh, it looks like there's one more. It says, our daughter has, oops. Come on, you should be able to read this as well. Christelle, can you read that second one? There's one yes. up on the chat. Yeah. So our daughter has CACC. So I think, uh, what is CACC? Probably complete 
complete, okay, complete agenesis of the corpus callosum and microcephaly. A whole exome sequencing was done, but she has a gene mutation on the LTN1 gene. Nothing came from my husband and me. So apparently it's a de novo mutation in LTN1. So I don't know the specific gene. I'm not sure if you know it, uh, Elliot. No. But I, I would be happy to get in touch if you, if you, I can look it up and um, tell you if, you know, I find it interesting. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Absolutely. She knows all 25,000 of them by heart. And uh, not all. <laughs> <laughs> Please, Linda. Right, so Linda's um, uh, raising a very important point. Um, all of us, if, if you sequence anyone in the room and their mom and dad, you're going to find a certain number, usually on the order of five or six um, new mutations that are in that child that weren't in mom or dad. Um, and most of those changes are not mutations in the sense of being causative of something pathogenic, um, but are just random genetic noise. But if you see the same gene mutated multiple times, then, as Linda was pointing out, then that increases the chances that those mutations are linked to the genetic condition, or rather linked to the clinical condition or the anatomic condition. Um, and there's, you know, uh, there are statisticians who spend their whole careers trying to figure out appropriate ways to measure that. Um, because on the one hand, um, it seems straightforward, um, but it, it, it actually depends on the kind of mutation it is and where that mutation is in the genome. All of those things can influence um, the odds that a change is pathogenic. And Christelle, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I think you, you explained it very, very nicely. So um, uh, yeah, we have all de novo mutation in our genome. So if we look at the whole genome it would be more than 100. Um, and some of them just happen to be encoding regions. So if we are lucky, uh, it's in a gene uh, that is not um, necessary or, or recessive, so we, we will not be affected if it's uh, in, in a gene like this. But if it's a gene um, that is um, where both copies are, are required for normal development, then um, of course uh, this would lead to a disorder. Um, so it's a bit like a, a lottery, uh, this de novo mutation. Right, right. So yes, exactly. You need you need to see that gene being changed in what looks like pathogenic ways. Um, in more than one individual, usually four or five or, or more, before you can be confident that that's the cause. Um, and you still don't know, it, anyway, it's a longer discussion. Um, uh, it's too early for a beer in the, in the day, but um, it... Right, right. Right, and I think um, Christelle might have been underselling her science a little bit. When she showed some of the examples, she showed first that there was one family that they were working with and they identified a candidate mutation. And then by collaborating with other scientists, mostly in Europe, but, but around the world, they found other families that had mutations in the same gene and had similar medical issues and that's when it became more obvious that there was a direct connection okay um i think everyone is probably ready for um a small break and we're going to lunch break um and we'll resume in an hour one at 1 30. okay
Thanks, Priscilla. Bye-bye. See you.